So, you have a movie for me? Yes, sir, I do. So it's based on this fantasy book series, right? Which has sold a lot of copies. Oh, okay, sorry, I got bored by the word book there for a second, but I'm listening now, so what's this series about? Well, it's called Harry Potter, sir, and it's about this kid called Harry Potter. I understand completely. And so this evil wizard Voldemort tried to kill Harry and his parents when he was a baby, right? But not only did Harry survive, it seems like he killed Voldemort. Oh, uh, retaliatory babies are tight. Actually, he was like, Protected by the power of his dying mother's love. Oh, his mother's love is tight. Oh, I don't know about that sentence. I don't love how it sounded either, but I said it and there's no taking it back. So anyway, we're gonna meet this wizard Dumbledore, right? And he wants to leave baby Harry with his non-magical family, but he doesn't want to be seen doing magic in the suburbs. So what does he do? He does some magic in the suburbs. He turns all the streetlights into flying magic balls and zips them down the street at him. Ah, you know, I think walking down the street normally might have drawn less attention than the magic flying light balls. Maybe. So Dumbledore's gonna explain to these other wizards, Hagrid and Professor McGonagall, that Harry's gonna be famous in the wizarding world, so it's better for him to grow up away from all that. I guess that's better. So he's like, let's just leave Harry in an abusive family for a decade and then kind of spring all this on him when he's a 10-year-old. And that's better than growing up rich and famous. That's what Dumbledore's going with. So then Harry's about to turn 11 and he starts receiving letters from this magic school called Hogwarts where Dumbledore is the headmaster. Okay, but his family, they don't like him. They don't want him to read these letters. Why not? Because they hate him so much they want to... I keep him around. I don't know. That works. So the uncle keeps destroying these letters and they keep showing up, but Harry just can't get his hands on one long enough to read it. Wow, well, it's too bad they don't have a magical letter that just kind of shouts the message at you. Uh, well, no, actually, they do have that. Those are called howlers. Oh, sounds like maybe they just could have sent him one of those. Well, we don't introduce them till a future movie, so that's as good as them not existing right now. That makes sense. So anyway, then that Hagrid guy shows up and tells Harry that he's a wizard and takes him away from his family. Very exciting. So Hagrid brings him to get all the stuff he needs for school. Like he gets an owl named Hedwig. Oh, Hedwig. Yeah, he's super cute. Don't get too attached. What? Oh, and also Harry has to get a wand, right? So he goes to this place called Ollivander's and just destroys the place. Does he get in trouble? No, that just kind of seems like this guy's way of doing things. Just let children destroy his stuff until they find a wand that works. Interesting business model. So anyway, eventually Harry gets on the train to Hogwarts and he meets this kid, Ron Weasley, and he's got a rat on his crotch. Oh. Oh my god. Oh yeah, no, it sounds gross, but in a later movie we're gonna find out that the rat is actually a middle-aged man disguised as a rat. Oh, that's so much worse. Oh yeah, I guess that is worse. Anyway, turns out Ron's poor, so Harry buys all the candy on the cart for just the two of them. Okay, kind of a jerk move, actually. What if the other kids on the train wanted some candy? Well, that's too bad, because Harry's rich and rich people get what they want. That is true, yeah. And then they also meet this know-it-all Hermione, and they get to Hogwarts together. Oh boy, and what happened? there. Well, this Draco Malfoy kid wants to be Harry's friend, but he's super mean to Ron, so Harry's like, uh -huh, no thank you. Oh, okay, that's a nice move. Yeah, so he chooses to be friends with Ron instead, who's so mean to Hermione that she cries in a bathroom. Oh my god. So then all the new students get sorted into these four houses, one of which is just for the evil kids. Why would they have that? And then the school year begins. Wow, so what kind of stuff are they gonna do? Oh, just all kinds of life-threatening things. Oh, very dangerous. They also celebrate celebrate Christmas. Wizards celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. Yeah, even though a lot of his miracles are things they learn as 11 year olds, turns out the wizarding world developed the same religious practices as non-magical people. Huh. So anyway, throughout the movie, they start suspecting that this evil looking Professor Snape is after this magical stone. Oh, is it magical? Well, this freaking thing can make you immortal. And they see Snape doing kind of sketchy things, so they think he wants to bring Voldemort back to life. But kind of sketchy stuff. Like at a certain point, it seems like he's trying to make Harry fall off his flying broomstick, so Hermione sets him on fire. Holy, she just straight up murders a guy? I no, just like his robe, it's okay. Oh, okay. But at the end of the movie, we're gonna find out it was actually this Professor Quirrell guy who was trying to jinx the broom and the fire made him lose his eye contact. Why didn't he just restart the jinxing after the fire was out? I don't know. Fair enough. So eventually they find out that the stone is actually in Hogwarts and a bunch of professors put spells to try to keep it safe. Okay. And so Harry and Ron and Hermione, they decide they need to stop Snape from getting 
getting it. So what are some of these challenges? Well, the first one is a giant three-headed dog that you need to get past to get into this little trap door in this little room. They kept a dog locked in a room for a full year? That's, that's kind of messed up. No, it's not. Oh, okay. And then there are going to be a couple more, like a giant chess game where you have to sit on the pieces and you get attacked. Oh. Yeah, and so Ron falls from like three feet in the air and then he's, you know, just kind of a big drama queen about it. Very dramatic. So now Hermione has to help Ron and Harry carries on by himself. And how does that go? Well, he ends up finding Professor Quirrell standing in front of this mirror trying to figure out how to get the stone out of it. Oh, okay. And then he reveals that he's actually had the Dark Lord Voldemort's face under his turban this whole time. Oh. Must have been very awkward for him to poop all year. Yeah, no, can't imagine those were pleasant for either of them. You think he ever went to scratch his head and accidentally poked the Dark Lord in the eye? You know, maybe. Do you think they said goodnight to each other before bed every night, or was it just awkward silence? I don't know. Maybe let's not think about this too much. Oh, okay. Anyway, so then the stone magically appears in Harry's pocket because of the magic mirror. Oh, wow, wow, wow. Wow. So now Professor Quirrell comes after him. Oh man, it's gonna be tough for him to defend himself against a full-grown man in the tiny face of a dead man. Actually, it's gonna be super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? Yeah, it turns out his mom's love is like super plot armor, so he turns Professor Quirrell to dust just by touching him. Oh my god, he kills a teacher? He does, yeah, and so that's a happy turn of events. This child took this man's life very easily. Jeez. So then Dumbledore explains to Harry that this mirror had a spell on it where the stone would only transfer to somebody who wanted to find the stone but not use it. So that's why Professor Quirrell couldn't get it. Exactly. Wow. So all the other challenges were kind of unnecessary, huh? Ah. Uh. Yeah, kinda. And you know, arguably, Harry made the situation much more dangerous by showing up. The stone would have stayed in the mirror, it never would have been within Voldemort's grasp. Yeah, okay, well we're gonna play the moment as heroic, okay? Yeah, I guess. So anyway, then it's the end of the year, and there's this thing called the House Cup, where like, throughout the year, each house gets points and loses points based on the stuff they do. Okay. And the good guy house, Gryffindor, is dead last, and the bad guy house, Slytherin, they win. Oh, well. You know, bummer. Yeah, but then Dumbledore, he's like, hey, everybody, shut the hell up, because Harry Potter here killed one of the teachers with his bare hands. Yeah. So he gives Harry and all his friends a bunch of points for killing that man, you know, ending that guy's life, being the last face he ever saw. This... I imagine this is phrased better in the book. Yeah, I think, probably. All right. Oh, and also Dumbledore spoke with this guy, Nicholas Flamel, who was being kept alive by the stone, and he agreed to just die and let the stone be destroyed. Oh. Yeah, the guy's been alive for like 600 years, so he's like, yeah, okay, destroy the stone. I've lived long enough. Probably should have had that talk in the first place before storing the stone at Hogwarts and endangering all the students. Maybe. So then Harry gets on the train to go home and waves like a normal person. What are you talking about? The way he waves? It's perfectly normal. Okay, I mean, yeah, all right. So then that's it. What do you think? Well, you know, it sounds like a pretty good time. What's this first movie called anyway? Like, what's the full title? Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Oh, okay. And also Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, because that first one I said is kind of hard. Wait, what? So, you have some new Harry Potter for me? Yes, sir, I do. So the Dursleys have this very important business dinner, right? And Harry has to stop this wacky house elf from disrupting it. Oh. So this is like a Harry Potter sitcom spin-off? No, actually, it's a movie. Really? Yeah, see, the Malfoy servant Dobby shows up because he wants to stop Harry from returning to Hogwarts. He says something bad is being planned. Oh, sounds dangerous. It will be. So after Dobby ruins this dinner, the Dursleys are sick of having Harry living in their house. So what do they do? Well, they make sure Harry can't leave their house. I see no problem with that logic, sure. But then Harry gets rescued by the Weasley kids in a flying car, so he escapes. Oh boy, time for the Hogwarts. Express. Uh, we'll actually see Dobby makes them miss the train, so they take the flying car to school and crash into the Whomping Willow. What's the Whomping Willow? It's just this tree they have at the school where if you get too close to it, it bludgeons you to death. Oh my god, why would they have that at a school? Well, in the next book we find out is to conceal a passageway for this werewolf to go transform. So put a spell or something, isn't there a concealing spell? Yeah, I mean, probably, but they go with tree that might punch a child to death. Jeez. And then the car drives itself off into the Forbidden Forest, because 
I guess it has a mind of its own. Oh, it does. Yeah, well, wizards seem to have this casual godlike power to spontaneously create life. Like Ron makes a bunch of slugs, Malfoy makes a snake. Oh, that has massive moral implications. No, it doesn't. Oh, all right. So there's this new defense against the dark arts teacher, Gilderoy Lockhart, right? And what's his deal? Well, he's this super famous wizard who wrote a bunch of books about his encounters with dark creatures, except he's a fraud. He didn't do any of it. Why would a celebrity accept a job teaching things he doesn't know and risk being exposed? I don't know. Well, okay then. So anyway, throughout the school year, there's this mysterious monster going around the school, and it petrifies some students and a cat and Hermione and a ghost. Oh no. Yeah, and so people are trying to figure out what it is, right? Wow, well thank God they have those talking portraits all over the school. One of them must have seen something. No. All right. And so the only way to unpetrify these people is to make this potion using mandrakes, but they take a while to mature. And how are they planning on unpetrifying the ghost? Oh, off screen. Oh, perfect. So everybody's trying to figure out who's responsible for this, you know, and people suspect Harry. How come? Oh, the whole school sees him during a silent night walk. You know, when you walk with your whole school through the hallway silently together? That's not a thing. It might be. And then also Hagrid gets blamed, so he gets sent to Azkaban prison. Oh no. Yeah, so he tells Harry and Ron to go talk to a giant spider in the forest. Seems dangerous, kind of messed up that he sent them there. Yeah, and so this giant spider's like, yeah, Hagrid's innocent. I guess that's why he sent you to clear his own name. Anyway, now my children will eat you. Oh man, it's gonna be hard to get out of that situation. Actually, it's gonna be super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? Yeah, cause out of nowhere that magic car shows up cause it can think for itself, which isn't a horrifying thought, I guess. A machina ex machina, as the Italians would say. They wouldn't say that. So eventually we find out that Ginny is actually being manipulated by the diary of Voldemort. He's the bad guy. Yeah, and so she's the one who opened this chamber of secrets place in the school and set the monster free. And so what is this monster? It's called a basilisk, and it's this massive snake that was moving through the school's plumbing. Jeez, how big are the school's pipes? Well, these wizard kids eat a lot, sir. Food just kind of appears. That's a good point, and that's a lot of food. And if you make eye contact with a basilisk, you die. But everybody saw it indirectly, so they were petrified. And the giant snake doesn't eat anyone afterwards? No, it just spooks them, then back to the poop tubes. Got it. And so how did they figure all this out? Well, one day Ginny had decided to dispose of the diary by throwing it in a toilet. That is how people get rid of books. Then Harry found the book, so obviously he kept it. Can't blame him. Toilet books are tight. And so Harry DMs with Voldemort for a little bit because his 16-year-old self is preserved in the diary. A little chat sesh with Voldy, sure. So eventually Harry and Ron head into the Chamber of Secrets with Professor Lockhart because Ginny's been taken down there. Oh, that seems like the worst teacher they could bring. Yeah, and he is because he tries to erase their memories to take credit for all their bravery. Does it work? No, because he uses Ron's broken wand, so it backfires and he erases his own memory, which is perfect, because now Ron can stay back with him. Why is that a good thing? Well, because Harry's the main character, and it's cooler if he goes alone. That is true. So then Harry meets Voldemort, except he used to go by Tom Riddle, and he shows Harry some cool wordplay he did to come up with his name. Wow, two guys in robes doing wordplay in a basement? It's kind of crazy that this is going to make like a billion dollars. Well, it does get a little more exciting, sir, because Harry has to fight a basilisk now. Oh man, it's gonna be hard to stand a chance against that thing. Actually, it's gonna be super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? Yeah, cause Dumbledore's Phoenix Fox shows up out of nowhere and he pokes the basilisk's eyes out and gives Harry a sword and heals him when he gets hurt. Should this maybe be called Fox in the Chamber of Secrets? Seems like he's taking care of pretty much everything. Well, Harry does a couple things. He stabs the snake and he stabs a book. A very stabby wizard. What else does he stab? That's it for the stabbing. Oh. And so Dumbledore's so happy that Harry killed a snake and stabbed a book that he cancels everybody's exams. Oh, this guy doesn't give a crap about their education. Not really, no. Sick. Oh, and also we find out that Draco's father, Lucius, is the one who slipped the diary to Ginny at the beginning of the movie. Very sneaky. It is. And then Harry tricks Lucius into setting his house elf Dobby free. How does he manage that? Well, see, the only way to set a house elf free is to present it with clothing, right? Okay. So Harry hides a sock inside a book that he gives to Lucius, so when he gives it to Dobby, he technically gives him clothing. Oh, so it's literally if you accidentally hand them clothes, they're free. It would seem so, sir. And that makes for a super complicated laundry day. Yeah, I guess it does. So then Lucius is so mad, he tries to murder Harry, but Dobby jumps in and saves the day. Oh, is he just gonna use a death curse on an 11-year-old on school grounds? Yes. This guy's hardcore. He is, but Dobby saves the day, so that's nice. So why was Dobby specifically warning Harry at the beginning of the movie? Seems like a bunch of people were in danger. Well, Harry's the main character. That's a good point. Wow, well, I kind of like this Dobby character. I know, right? But don't get too attached. I think JK is going to kill all the cute ones. Oh my god, no. 
So, you have a new Harry Potter for me? Yes, sir, I do. So Harry Potter's at the Dursleys, right? The abusive family that everybody knowingly sends him back to every summer? That's the one. So he's in bed doing that Lumo spell over and over again. Isn't him doing magic outside of Hogwarts, like, forbidden? Yeah, I mean, technically not a super important detail, though. Okay. So then this terrible aunt comes over, and she's just the worst. I mean, she's super mean, and he accidentally turns her into a big floaty balloon. Oh, very satisfying. Yeah, but now Harry's gotta go on the run because he did magic outside of school. You can't do that. But that you just started the movie with him doing some. Oh, I did do that, didn't I? Whoops. Whoopsie, you silly goose. You goose that's silly. So anyway, then he takes this wacky convenience bus that wizards have and heads to the leaky cauldron. And what happens there? Well, the minister of magic is like, oh yeah, don't worry about the magic stuff. That's fine. Okay. So Harry gets some of his school books, one of which is a book of monsters that's an actual monster. Like it tries to bite you and it tears apart its own pages. Who would even publish that? I mean, sir, I feel like it's clear at this point that wizards have, like, zero consumer protection laws. That's a good point. So then Harry goes back to Hogwarts, which this year has completely changed geographically. What? So then Dumbledore gives his annual opening speech, you know, about all the different ways the kids might die this year. Oh, this guy freaking hates when kids are safe. He really does. So what does Voldemort have in store this year? Nothing. Oh, yeah, playing it laid back, giving everyone a year off this year. A very considerate dark wizard. You see, the threat this year is this dangerous escaped convict Sirius Black. Oh. Yeah, and apparently he wants to kill Harry Potter and he's the one who ratted out his parents to Voldemort. Sounds like it's pretty serious. He's decent looking, sure. That's not, never mind. Okay, so I guess they give Harry some extra security, huh? They don't, no. Oh, they don't. No, instead they have a bunch of these horrible creatures called Dementors all over the place and they'll suck out your soul if you get too close, so they're very deadly. So to stop a student from maybe being killed, they bring in a bunch of things that might kill students. That's what they're going with. Interesting strategy. And so throughout the year, Harry's gonna get to know the new Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher, this guy Professor Lupin. And what's his deal? Well, he shows them this creature called the Boggart that takes the form of whatever you're the most afraid of. Oh. Yeah, so when he looks at it, he sees a full moon because he's secretly a werewolf. The guy with the name that basically means wolf in Latin is a werewolf? A real wacky coinkadink of a last name on that one, sir. Wow, wow, wow. Wow. So the trick to defeating a boggart is to imagine your fear doing something really funny. Like this one girl's afraid of a giant snake, so she thinks of a giant unblinking clown. Oh my god, how is that better? Yeah, I don't know about that one, to be honest. Jeez. So anyway, eventually the Weasley twins give Harry this little map called the Marauder's Map. And what does that do? This is freaking map of Hogwarts that shows you where everybody is. Okay. And then one day Harry sees this name on the map, Peter Pettigrew. But Lupin's like, that's impossible. That guy's dead. Oh, very mysterious. Yeah, very mysterious. And later a dog drags Ron under a tree. Is that related to the plot or is that just a thing that happens to Ron? Both, technically. So now Harry and Hermione have to save him, but that tree is the Whomping Willow. Okay, now is that that willow that whomps? That's the one, yeah. I thought so. So the Whomping Willow freaking picks up Hermione, sends her spinning around in the air like crazy. Uh-oh. And then as she's whizzing on by, she picks up Harry with one arm and drags him along too. I feel like that would snap her arm. Yeah, no, she's got like super strength for this one scene. Don't worry about it. Oh, okay, I won't. And then she launches him into this hole under the tree thanks to the superhuman coordination she also has in this scene. Oh, tree holes are tight. Gross, sir. So then they end up in this house and Sirius Black is there. Oh, no. And then Lupin pops out too and turns out they're buddies. Oh. And they're gonna talk super vaguely for a while to make it seem like they're evil and like they're gonna kill Harry, but they're not. Oh, characters love speaking vaguely right before big twists. They sure do, sir. So then it turns out that Ron's rat, who was always on his lap, was a full-grown man named Peter Pettigrew, a.k.a. Wormtail, this whole time. Uh, that has just the most unsettling implications. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Fred and George never wondered why on the Marauder's map there was a guy named Peter in bed with their brother every night. None of their business. So what was Wormtail's strategy? Just live with the Weasleys for 12 years in the hopes that the kids would become friends with important wizards? Sure seems that way. And what was Sirius's strategy? Just break into a heavily guarded school and kill the one guy who could clear his his name? Sure seems that way. Well, okay then. So what happens with Wormtail? Well, he ends up escaping because Lupin forgot to take his full moon potion on a full moon, so he turns into a werewolf. A werewolf whose biggest fear is full moons forgot about the full moon? He does. And then also some Dementors start attacking, so Harry and Sirius are both, like, about to die. Oh man, it's gonna be tough to get out of that situation. Actually, it's gonna be super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? Yeah, see, they use Hermione's time machine to go help themselves. Well, Hermione has a 
time machine? Yeah, she was entrusted with this time turner device so she could double up on her classes and learn more. Why would they trust her? She's broken multiple rules multiple times over the past couple of movies. Yeah, but see, she's book smart, so they give her the ability to, you know, mess with time itself. Well, well, okay, well, that's gonna be a super helpful device moving forward. No, 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 no. But no, 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 never again. Okay, but no. Nope. All right. And so all that works out well, but Sirius gets captured because now that Wormtail's gone, there's nobody to prove his innocence. Can they maybe use a truth potion to prove what happened or do that thing where they pull memories out of people's heads? Oh, well, here's the thing about that. Shut up about that. Oh, that's super mean. So they go break Sirius out of the little cell he's being kept in and set him free. Aren't there any guards or anything? No, see, they capture one of the most wanted criminals in the wizarding world and leave him in a little unguarded cell. Oh, well, that's great. Yeah, it worked out fantastic. So how does the movie end? Well, Harry gets a very nice new broom and then we freeze frame on him enjoying it. What? Yeah, just an aggressive freeze frame on him enjoying it. That's a choice. It sure is, sir. So what do you think? Well, it sounds like a great movie. Thank you. One more thing, though. Unfortunately, we're gonna have to find somebody new to play Dumbledore since Richard Harris passed away. Oh, uh, yeah. Did you have anyone in mind? Well, I don't know, but it's gotta be someone who could bring his mysterious nature and great wisdom to the screen, you know? That's a good point, yeah. And that'll have to do until one day we cash in and give people the young, hot Dumbledore they really want. Why would anyone want to see that? I don't see that happening. So, you have that new Harry Potter movie for me? Yes, sir, I do. Wow, so what's going on with the characters? Well, I'll tell you, sir, all the guy characters decided it's time to have long hair for a year. Oh, okay, that's kind of random. A little bit. Is that the only thing going on this year, or? Nope, there's more, actually. So Harry and Hermione and the Weasleys are gonna go to this thing called the Quidditch World Cup. Okay. And they're also going with Arthur Weasley's co-worker and his son, Cedric Diggory. How were we introduced to him? Just the normal way, you know, he suddenly drops out of a tree. That's not normal normal. Sure it is. So they head to the World Cup and there are a ton of wizards there. Very cool. Wow, I can't wait to see what the Quidditch World Cup is like. Right? Sounds super cool, doesn't it? So then we're gonna cut to right after it's all done. Oh. And the event's gonna get attacked by some Death Eaters and Harry's gonna get knocked unconscious. Oh no. Yeah, and so later he wakes up and everything's been burned to the ground and he's the last one there. Not a single person saw him there and he wasn't affected by the fire or smoke. That's what we're going with. And then this Death Eater, Barty Crouch Jr. shows up and shoots a dark mark into the sky. Oh, very ominous. Anyway, so eventually Harry goes back to Hogwarts and Dumbledore gives his annual speech about all the ways the kids might die this year. As is tradition, sure. So what's going on this year? Well, this year Hogwarts has been chosen to host something called the Triwizard Tournament. And what's that? It's this big competition between three wizarding schools. So a bunch of people from these two other schools come in and do little dances for some reason. Oh, that's fun. So to have a chance at being chosen, you need to be at least 17 and you need to put your name in something called the Goblet of Fire, and only one wizard per school can be chosen. Okay. And once the three names are chosen, somehow there's a fourth name, and it's Harry Potter. Wait, so are the students from the other schools just gonna live at Hogwarts now? Yes. Even the ones that weren't chosen? Yeah, they're all just gonna kinda live there for a year. That's kinda weird. No, it's not. So then Dumbledore runs up to Harry and shakes him like crazy and says, Harry, did you put your name in the Goblet of Fire? Oh, that doesn't really sound like Dumbledore. Isn't he more calm and collected? Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Well, I'm profoundly angry angry inside all the time, so maybe I project it onto him a little bit. You should maybe see somebody about that. No! Alright, so anyway, this is a super dangerous tournament, and if you're chosen, you're magically bound to compete. What does that mean? You have to do it. Right, but what happens if you don't do it? I don't know, I guess you die or something, right? That seems to be the implication. Why would this be a thing? Well, sir, they really want to know which school has the best wizard child, so death's gotta be on the table here. Oh my god. So throughout the year, Harry's gotta figure out what these three events are gonna be and how he should prepare. Got it. And freaking Draco Malfoy's gonna drop out of a tree and make fun of him. Why is everyone up in trees? So they can drop out of them at the starts of conversations. But, so anyway, then this new teacher, Mad-Eye Moody, pops out and confronts Malfoy, turns him into a ferret. Why is he called Mad-Eye Moody? Well, one of his eyes is magic and zooms in like a camera lens and goes, Isn't it magic? Why is it making mechanical lens noises? Unclear. But anyway, at the end of the movie, there's gonna be a big reveal where Mad-Eye Moody was actually that Barty Crouch Jr. guy the whole time taking polyjuice potion. Oh, very twisty. Extremely, sir. So for the first event, Harry's gotta steal an egg from a dragon. Oh boy. But this thing breaks loose from its chain and chases Harry around Hogwarts. Wow, so I guess the teachers must intervene, huh? A dragon is loose on school grounds. Now they just kinda watch. That checks out, actually. That seems on brand for them. And then once he gets the egg, he's gotta go listen to it underwater while a ghost tries to look at his wiener. What? So then eventually for the next competition, he's gotta go underwater for an extended period of time. Oh, how come? Well, cause see, the organ 
organizers have kidnapped people that the champions care about. So like Ron and Hermione are there. There's the eight-year-old sister of one of them. Underwater. It tied up underwater. So Harry saves the life of Ron, but also of the eight-year-old girl since her big sister got eliminated. Oh, wow. So obviously Dumbledore gives them some extra points for bravery because he does that any chance he gets. Wait, so they just kidnap some kids against their will and put them underwater and we're gonna let them drown if the champions fail the task. Yeah. That little girl would have drowned to death if Harry hadn't saved her. Yeah, because like I said, they gotta know which young wizard is the best young wizard. So yeah, she would have drowned. This, man, I, wizards are not okay people, I think. Anyway, everybody in the stands goes nuts, obviously. What were they watching the whole time? Just the lake? Yeah, they were staring at a lake for an hour, so that's a fun activity to watch. Staring at lakes is tight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's the next event gonna be? They're all gonna stare at some hedges. Thrilling. Yeah, the final challenge is this giant hedge maze to find the Triwizard Cup, but it grabs you with its plantiness, so it's very scary. Man, Hogwarts just has the most violent vegetation. It sure does, sir. So then Harry and Cedric grab the cup at the exact same time, but it was a port key and it teleports them to a graveyard. Spooky. Very spooky, sir. And then Wormtail's gonna pop out with a little baby Voldemort and kill Cedric. You know, I'm actually shocked it's taken four years for a kid to die. So it turns out Barty Crouch Jr. planned this whole thing because they needed a bit of Harry's blood to bring Voldemort back to life. He taught a class for a full year to get a couple of drops of blood. Yeah, and put his name in the Goblet of Fire and kind of laid out the path for him to be the one to touch the port key. That's, he could have just pricked him with a needle and then ran away. Yeah, but that'd make for a very, very quick movie. So he's gonna go with this overly complicated plan that makes it more exciting. I guess. So anyway, then Voldemort gets a full body again. Uh-oh. Yeah, except for the nose. That doesn't grow in for some reason. Maybe he's a late bloomer. Maybe it'll grow in later. It won't. So now Voldemort wants to kill Harry. Oh man, it's gonna be hard to survive an encounter with the Dark Lord. Actually, it's gonna be super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? Yeah, because he gets some help from a couple of friendly ghosts. Oh. Do these ones try to look at his wiener? No, these ghosts are his parents' ghosts. And also Cedric is a ghost, and he's pretty chill about being dead. Our ghost back up. Yeah, and so then Harry's able to grab the port key and go back to the tournament. Well, good thing it was a two-way port key. It worked out pretty well, sir. So then everybody's in shock that Cedric is dead, and Harry takes off with Mad-Eye Moody. And does Harry figure out that it's not the real Mad-Eye Moody? He does. And then this guy recaps the entire school year for so long that Dumbledore and some teachers have time to bust in and help Harry. Oh, great. Yeah, and then coincidentally, at that very moment, his polyjuice potion runs out. Fantastic dramatic potion timing. Definitely. So what do you think? Well, it sounds like a great Harry Potter movie, you know? Thank you. I just feel kind of bad for whatever actor's gonna play that Cedric Diggory character, you know? In all probability, that'll be the biggest role of his career. Yeah, yeah. Poor guy. So, you have a new Harry Potter movie for me? Yes, sir, I do. In Order of the Phoenix, the name of this one. Oh, like a, like a, like a, like a group of urologists? What? No, Phoenix. Oh, okay, that makes more sense. Yeah, they're a bunch of wizards. In Arizona. No? Okay, keep going. I'll catch on eventually, probably. All right, so Harry's swinging on a swing set like a little boy, and Dudley comes to pick on him, and let me tell you, he's totally changed his clothing style. Nice. But then they get attacked by some Dementors who show them their scary butthole mouths. Oh, no. Yeah, so then Harry uses his Patronus charm to get rid of them, but then he finds out he's been expelled from Hogwarts for doing that. Well, that doesn't seem fair. No, it doesn't. So Dumbledore manages to get the Ministry to agree to at least a hearing. Well, good. So this group of wizards called the Order of the Phoenix pick him up from the Dursleys on some magic brooms, and they fly past some awesome London landmarks. They make him fly through public spaces on a magic broom because he's got to go to a hearing about having done underage magic in public. That's right, sir. So then Dumbledore manages to keep Harry at Hogwarts, but the Ministry's up to some funny business. Oh, they are? Yeah, see, they're doing everything they can to stop people from believing that Voldemort might be back. Oh, very sketchy. Yeah, and they put one of their people, Dolores Umbridge, at Hogwarts as the new Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher. And what's her deal? Well, she's this short little lady, wears a lot of pink, really likes cats. Oh, she doesn't sound so bad. She's the absolute worst, and people are gonna hate her more than they hate Voldemort. Oh, my God. Yeah, she's super snooty and mean, and she even interrupts Dumbledore's annual intro speech about how all the students are in grave danger. Oh, but he loves giving that speech. He really does, sir. Oh, and also since Harry saw Cedric die in the last movie, he can now see these creatures called Thestrals, which you can only see when you've seen someone die. He saw his mom die. Oh, yeah, he did, but he was too young to understand what death was. He watched Professor Quirrell die just a couple years ago. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but the situation about that one is I'm gonna need you to get all the way off my back about it. Oh, okay, let me get off of that, that, that back of yours. So anyway, Umbridge says she's not gonna teach the students any 
defense spells, so Harry gets mad. He does? Yeah, he's like, Voldemort is back. I watched him murder Cedric Diggory. Wormtail murdered Cedric. Voldemort was still a little baby. Oh yeah, whoops. Whoopsie. Anyway, so Umbridge gives Harry detention and makes him use a quill that carves into your flesh. Oh, which... Which, which is not normal. Oh, it's not. Okay, sorry. It just seems like Hogwarts students are always being forced to do like super violent, dangerous things. It felt on brand, but that's not normal, you're saying. It's not. Wow, well, okay. So Umbridge starts imposing a bunch of crazy rules and posting them up on a wall where you can't even see them and the students are getting pissed. So what are they gonna do? Well, they make a secret club called Dumbledore's Army and Harry starts teaching everybody spells in the room of requirement. Oh, that's that room where you get, you get the requirements in there. That's the one. So the bad guys know that they're doing something in this specific spot, but they just can't catch them in the act. Oh, catching people in the act is tight. What? That's why I'm always kicking down motel room doors. Oh my god. So then what happens? You might be going to jail, sir. So then we have a really romantic scene where Harry kisses Cho Chang. Aww. In front of a picture of the guy she was dating. You know, the recently deceased one? Oh. As she's crying about him. Oh. Anyway, so eventually Umbridge forces Cho to tell them where everybody's practicing and then she busts down the wall I thought they already knew where the meetings were. They did. So why didn't Umbridge break down that wall earlier? Unclear. And so since they called themselves Dumbledore's Army, he takes the blame for everything and escapes by clapping on a bird. Oh, wow, 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 wow. So then Umbridge becomes headmaster and she starts controlling everything. It gets real crappy. Oh, no. And Harry eventually has this magical vision of Sirius being attacked in the Ministry of Magic, so they gotta get there ASAP. How are they gonna do that? Well, the only usable flu network fireplace is in Umbridge's office so they try to use it, but she busts them. Uh-oh, it's gonna be hard for them to get there with Umbridge on their back. Actually, it's gonna be super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? You see, they trick her into going into the Forbidden Forest by saying that Dumbledore had a secret weapon in there. She just believes them and goes with them into the forest with no backup? She does, and then some centaurs and Hagrid's half-brother mess her up and drag her away. Amazing, so now they can go to the Ministry. Exactly, so they hop on some Thestrals and fly over there. Why don't they just use the flu network thing in Umbridge's office? since she's out of the picture now. I don't know. So they get there and go into the Department of Mysteries, which has these prophecy balls stacked super high up. Oh, very highly stacked balls. Yeah, and they need to find this one about Harry Potter and Voldemort, so then they do, and they grab it. Wow, well, thank God it wasn't one of the ones at the top of the stack. Yeah, it worked out great, but then some Death Eaters pop out, and it turns out it was all a trick. Oh, no. Yeah, because see, the only person who can take a prophecy is the person who the prophecy is about, and Voldemort really wanted to know what was in this one. If it was also about Voldemort, Voldemort, couldn't he have grabbed it? Yeah, but he's like a big boss guy. He doesn't do stuff himself. That's a good point. And we're also gonna see that one of the bad guys is Sirius's cousin, Bellatrix Lestrange. And what's her deal? Oh, well, she actually tortured and killed Neville's parents when he was a baby. So when she sees them, she's like, hey, Neville, how's your parent? How your parents doing, buddy? How does she recognize him if she last saw him as a baby? Oh, I don't know. Uh, magic, probably, I guess. I don't know. That makes sense. So anyway, then the Order of the Phoenix all show up and there's this big fight and then Bellatrix kills Sirius. Oh, no. Oh. Yeah, so Harry's all pissed and he wants to kill Bellatrix, but then Voldemort pops out. Whoa. Oh. But then Dumbledore pops out too. Whoa. These wizards are all about popping out. They are, sir. So then there's this big old duel, and then Voldemort gives Harry a terrifying vision of Voldemort in a hoodie. Oh, spooky. Yeah, and it's a zip-up hoodie too. He has no business wearing that. Anyway, so then Harry manages to make Voldemort leave with the power of friendship or something. Oh, the power of friendship is unstoppable. Give me a high five, my dear. Dude. No, no thank you. That'd be way too complicated editing-wise. That's fair. And so then Harry gets back with his friends and he's like, you know what I've been thinking? We have something Voldemort doesn't. Mmm, noses. Well, yeah, but also something worth fighting for. Ah, oh, very cute. And so that's about it. What do you think? Well, it sounds like money. We should start shooting ASAP. So then we can start shooting the next one and the next one? Yeah, I mean, at a reasonable pace, right? Want to make sure all the cast and crew are all good? Of course, of course. Their well-being is always our top priority. So, you have a new Harry Potter movie for me? Yes, sir, I do. And so the Death Eaters are getting real bold, right? Like, they straight up destroy the Millennium Bridge in London. Oh, man, bad guys hate when bridges are standing. Yeah, they do. Doesn't Harry Potter technically take place in the 90s, though? It does, yeah. Wasn't that bridge built in the year 2000? There's no way for me to check that, sir. Oh, okay, but there is, though. Actually, no. So we're gonna meet up with Harry Potter, and he's straight up reading a magical newspaper in front of muggles in a coffee shop. Oh, this guy never 
never learns not to do magical stuff in front of muggles. He certainly doesn't, sir. So he has this flirty thing going on with this girl, but then Dumbledore pops up like, Hey, no, Harry, it's time for my annual child endangerment plan. Oh, uh, that's cute. That's his favorite thing, putting kids in mortal danger. Yeah, and so Dumbledore needs some crucial information from this Professor Slughorn guy that was Voldemort's teacher back in the day. Okay. But Slughorn is ashamed, and so he's hiding the truth. But Dumbledore needs this information. You know, the fate of the world is at stake. Wow. So I guess he can use some of that truth serum stuff on him, huh? If the world is in danger. Yeah, I guess so. But instead, he's going to hire this guy as a teacher for an entire school year and send the teenager with PTSD on a multiple month-long spy mission. Yeah, I mean, that plan works too. That's just as good. Plus, Voldemort usually attacks at the end of the school year, so there's plenty of time here. That's a good point, sure. And so also, Draco Malfoy has been tasked with killing Dumbledore, and Professor Snape takes an unbreakable vow to protect him. Wow, an unbreakable vow, huh? Can that be broken? It, no. Okay, got it. That makes sense. So eventually the school year starts and Harry gets this used textbook that says it belonged to the Half-Blood Prince. Right. And this thing has handwritten instructions in it that are better than the actual book instructions, and so Harry makes the perfect liquid death potion. Feels kind of dangerous to have a bunch of teenagers try to make liquid death potion. Yeah, but this is Hogwarts, so they don't really teach kids anything unless it could lead to them dying a horrible death. Fair enough. So because Harry made the best liquid death potion, Professor Slughorn gives them a vile of liquid luck. What's that? Oh, it's this freaking potion that gives you incredible luck, but it's pretty hard to make, so it's pretty rare. Couldn't you take some and then while you have incredible luck, try to make some more? Hey, shut up, and so Harry has this bottle he can use any time. Wow, so I guess he uses it to get the information he needs from Slughorn, huh? Yeah, he'll eventually get around to doing that towards the end of the school year, but right now we gotta focus on the meat of the movie. Oh, uh, that's right, in the book there's the whole mystery about who the Half-Blood Prince is and Harry learning a bunch of stuff about Voldemort's past. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that'll be in here a tiny bit, but that's not what I'm talking about. What are you talking about then? Teenage romance! Oh, right, okay. Kind of want to know a lot more about the evil Dark Lord and the potential end of the world, though. Yeah, that kind of stuff is mostly going on in the background, but did you know that Ginny Weasley is dating Dean Thomas? I... No, I guess I didn't know that. And Ron starts dating Lavender Brown, who's completely changed since her first years at Hogwarts. Oh, like she grew up? No, she's white now. She didn't used to be. Oh, my God. And Hermione's jealous of their relationship because she has a crush on Ron. Oh, uh, what's going on with Voldemort, though? And eventually, Ginny and Dean Thomas break up, so now Harry's got a shot with her. All right, I mean, okay, do they at least have good chemistry? Not even a little. It's going to be super hard to watch. Dang. So she's going to feed him a little cookie and tie his shoes for him. Uh. And you'll never get guess who Hermione invites to Slughorn's Christmas party? I don't particularly care. Cormac McClaggan! Sure, okay, alright. The world's in danger though, right? Should we maybe spend a bit of time on that? And Slughorn taught his students how to make a love potion, and Ron accidentally takes some that was meant for Harry. Love potion, right, that thing that JK included in the book with horrible moral implications. And while he's in the hospital wing, he asks for Hermione instead of Lavender, so him and Lavender break up. Okay, can we, can there be some kind of action scene maybe, please? Okay, fine sir, tell you what, I'll have some Death Eaters set the Weasley house on fire. Does that happen in the book? No. Nope. Isn't that something they could pretty easily put out with magic? Probably, yeah, but we'll just have them watch it happen and look all sad. Alright, I mean, it's not a love scene, so that does feel like a breath of fresh air to me. Oh, and also throughout the movie, we're gonna sprinkle in little scenes of Draco Malfoy walking around Hogwarts all sketchy and going into the Room of Requirement. Okay. And Harry's gonna confront him at a certain point and use this Sectum Semper spell he read about in his book, but it turns out to be deadly. Oh. Yeah, but luckily Snape saves Draco's life at the last second. Wow, so Harry must get in a ton of trouble. Not particularly, no. I feel like he's gotten into a bunch of trouble for much less than almost killing a student. Yeah, but no, this is all good. This is okay, though. Well, okay, then. So then finally, Harry's gotta get this information from Slughorn, because the end of the year is approaching fast. Man, well, it's gonna be hard to get that secret out of Slughorn. Actually, it's gonna be super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? Yeah, see, he uses the liquid luck. Oh, right, it's true. That thing he had the entire time that he could have used at any point. That's right, and so he finds out that Slughorn had told Voldemort about how to make horcruxes and split his soul into multiple pieces and shove them into objects. Oh, wow, wow, wow. Wow. And so Dumbledore's like, right, okay, well, we already got two of the objects, and I think I know where the third is. Wait, so he already knew about the Horcruxes? I guess so, sir. But then to get this next Horcrux, Harry's gotta force Dumbledore to drink some cursed water. Oh, uh, forcing old people to drink is tight. Okay, and so they head back to Hogwarts, and Draco has managed to get some Death Eaters into the school. Why does he need the Death Eaters there? Because he needs to kill Dumbledore. So they help with that? No, he just kind of confronts him on his own. Oh, okay. But then Snape pops out and kills Dumbledore instead of 
Draco. Oh no. So Harry's so upset, he chases Snape and the Death Eaters and tries to kill Snape with Sectum Sempra. Jeez. And then Snape knocks Harry down and he's like, hey, guess what? I'm the Half-Blood Prince. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I guess if I had spent more time on that mystery, that would have been a bigger reveal, huh? Maybe. And Bellatrix wants to kill Harry, but Snape is like, no, he's for the Dark Lord. And she's like, oh yeah, you're right, okay. So they kidnap him and bring him to Voldemort? No, they just kind of leave him there. Oh, interesting strategy. And so, yeah, then everybody's pretty sad, and that's about it. What do you think? Well, I mean, honestly, it sounds like we're spending way too much time on teenage romance in this one. Yeah, well, see, the thing is, everybody's talking about those Twilight books, so I figure we could get in on that action a bit. Oh, that's a good point. I like the way you money. Thank you. Man, I can't believe we only have one of these books left to adapt after this. I know, sir. One more movie and that's it. No more money. No more money. That's it. Unless... So, you have the next Harry Potter movie for me? Yes, sir, I do. And let me tell you, stuff's getting real bad in the wizarding world. Oh, are we not gonna make these movies good anymore? No, that's gonna come a couple years from now. What I mean is that Voldemort and the Death Eaters are coming into power. Uh-oh. Yeah, so Harry sends the Dursleys away for their protection, and Hermione wipes her parents' memories away. Jeez, she couldn't have done the protection thing too? Nope, and so they forget all about her, and she's erased from all the pictures in the house, and it's very sad. So they're just gonna think they have framed pictures of empty rooms and stuff? I guess so, yeah. What happens when they talk to anybody who knew they had a daughter, like friends or family? I don't, I don't know. Oh, Hermione's parents are in for some very confusing conversations. Probably, yeah. So now the good guys need to help Harry escape by confusing the Death Eaters. How do they do that? Well, like half of them are gonna take Polyjuice Potion to look like him, so it's gonna be this wacky scene with a bunch of Harry Potters changing into similar clothes. Oh, hanging out with a bunch of shirtless copies of yourself is tight. It sure is, sir. So they fly up to the clouds, but a bunch of Death Eaters are waiting for them, so it's gonna be this massive battle. Why didn't all the good guys fly into different directions? Unclear, but then Hedwig saves Harry's life and dies. Oh no, Bird Friend! And also Mad-Eye Moody dies. Oh no, One-Eyed Friend, who is actually a completely different person for most of the time we ever saw him on screen. And because Hedwig tried to protect Harry, that gives away his real identity, so freaking Voldemort shows up and attacks them. Uh, those freaking guys, they had some good bird loyalty intel, huh? They sure did, sir. So Voldemort attacks, but a wand technicality and Harry's insane plot armor save his life. He does have some pretty fantastic plot armor, doesn't he? He truly does. So all the surviving wizards meet at the Weasley's house to be safe from the Death Eaters. The house that was destroyed by Death Eaters in the last movie? Yeah, they rebuilt it so everything's okay now. But they would still know where it was, right? That's the safest place they could think of. That's what we're going going with, so then it's time for a wedding. They're gonna have a wedding while they're all being chased by Death Eaters? Yeah, well, that's kind of the thing. They're like, maybe especially now it's important that we celebrate love and stuff. I guess that is a nice sentiment if it's like a little ceremony kind of under the radar. So then they have a massive wedding with a bunch of people and a bunch of Death Eaters attack it. Well, yeah, obviously, come on! Wizards? So Harry and Ron and Hermione escape and they decide they need to go find these Horcruxes. Oh boy, what kind of stuff are they gonna do? Oh, they're gonna break into the Ministry of Magic, which is now run by the bad guys, because Umbridge works there, and she has a Horcrux locket around her neck. Jeez, how are they gonna break in? They're gonna use Polyjuice Potion to pretend like they're three people that work there. Wow, you'd think the Ministry of Magic would have some kind of safeguard against that kind of thing. Well, they don't. It, it seems like people would do that kind of thing all the time. Like, how can they be sure about anyone's identity ever? They shut up, and so they manage to get the locket, and they keep going with their adventure. Oh boy, so what's next? Can Camping. What? So much camping, sir. They're gonna camp and camp and camp some more. Oh. All right. Campity, camp, camp, camp. Oh boy, are they gonna camp, sir? Okay, I got it. Okay, that's good. We're, I got it with the camping. Can we move on from the camping? Not really, no. It's gonna be a while. Okay, does anything exciting happen while they're camping? A little bit, yeah. Like, they take turns wearing the locket because it's evil and it does that thing to them. You know, like the ring in Lord of the Rings? It makes them get attacked by Sean Bean. No, like, it drives them a little insane and puts them in bad moods. Oh, that's not good. Yeah, and Ron's gonna end up getting jealous of Harry and Hermione, and he's gonna straight up 
leave. He's gonna stop camping with them. He's done with the camping, sir. Well, that's pretty serious, I guess. They seemed really into camping. So eventually, Harry's gonna find out that the Sword of Gryffindor is at the bottom of this frozen lake, and he needs it, because it can destroy Horcruxes. Oh, that'll be useful, probably. Yeah, so he gets into this icy cold water to go get it, but that evil necklace starts choking him. <laughs> oh, been there. You got choked underwater by a necklace? Yes. Okay, cool. And so anyway, then Ron shows up and saves him. Oh, how did he find him? Well, it turns out that Dumbledore had left Ron this little thingy that lets you turn off lights, but that also lets you find your friends when you need to find your friends. Well, magic sure is convenient. Those are wildly different features for a thingy to have. Yeah, it's pretty awesome, sir. So then Ron is gonna stab this locket thing, but then it pops open and starts playing mind games with him. Oh, like what? Like it's gonna try to scare him with some spiders. Mm, those are spooky. And then it shows him a fake vision of Harry and Hermione making out. That just seems like it would make him angrier and want to stab the locket. Yeah, that pisses him off, so then he stabs it. Yeah, really bad strategic planning there, locket. What are you doing? Anyway, so then later some Death Eaters are gonna chase them through the woods. So they disapparate? No, see, they don't disapparate when I want there to be a cool chase or fight scene, and so this is one of those moments. Oh, okay, gotcha. So then they're about to get caught, and so Hermione decides to deform Harry's face, but the bad guys still see that he has a scar, so they're like, hmm. Right. So they bring them all to Malfoy Manor, and all the bad guys are like, wow, I wonder if this guy with the Harry Potter scar that we caught with Harry Potter's best friends is Harry Potter or not. That's a tricky one, for sure. So then they put them all in a cell, and Bellatrix starts torturing Hermione. Oh man, it's gonna be hard for them to get out of that situation. Actually, it's gonna be super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? Yeah, see, Harry talks into this magical mirror shard that he has, and so that leads to Dobby, the house elf, coming to save them. Well, where did Harry get the mirror shard? Well, in the books, he got that. He got that at a certain point. But how did he get it in the movies? Oh, I don't know, but he's gonna have it. Oh, okay. So then Dobby saves them all, but Bellatrix manages to kill Dobby. Oh no, little house elf friend. And then Voldemort's gonna manage to get this thing called the Elder Wand from Dumbledore's tomb, and now he's super powerful, and he makes some very cool lightning. Oh boy, here we go. It's about to get crazy. Yeah. Well, go on. No. But we're done. Oh, that's extremely unsatisfying. Yeah, well, you know, we gotta cut this thing off somewhere if we're gonna do this new thing where we cut it off into two parts. Oh, that's right, we are doing that thing, aren't we? Wow, I wonder if that's gonna catch on. So, you have Deathly Hallows Part 2 for me? Yes, sir, I do. Amazing. And I was thinking, you know, maybe it'd be cool if we split this into two parts as well. Oh, I don't, I don't... And then when we get to the next part, we split that in two as well, and then those two parts into two pieces each. No one could ever stop us mathematically. Sir, unfortunately, I think we're gonna kinda have to end it with this one. We're kinda tapped out here. Oh, uh, damn it! Oh, my God. So anyway, what happens in this one? Right, so Harry and Ron and Hermione need to go into Bellatrix's vault at Gringotts, because they think there's a horcrux in there. So what do they do? Well, they use some frickin' polyjuice potion to make Hermione look like her. Okay, so none of the major wizarding institutions check for polyjuice potion. They just, they can't detect that kind of thing. That's right, sir, just like at the Ministry, although this time the goblins are a little suspicious because they've been given a heads up. Err, uh, so what's the good guy's strategy here? Well, Harry uses the Imperious Curse on the goblin that's suspicious of them, and he leads them to the vault. Isn't that an unforgivable curse? It is, yeah. Kind of, kind of a little messed up that he did that, isn't it? Well, Harry's a good guy, so it's kind of forgivable. Right, okay, so I guess he makes sure that this banker goblin who's just doing his job isn't harmed in any way. Oh, actually, no, while the goblin's under the curse, he gets burned alive by a dragon. Oh, my god. But the good guys get the horcrux and fly away on the dragon, so that's nice. I guess. But now they gotta go find more horcruxes, cause they gotta poke them on this situation, you know? They gotta catch them all. Is it gonna be hard to figure out where they all are? Actually, it's gonna be super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? Really? Yeah, because see, when the plot demands it, Harry gets these visions showing him how to keep the story going, like where Voldemort might be or where the Horcruxes might be. Oh, that's very handy, and it's not a two-way thing, like Voldemort can't see where Harry is. Somehow he can't, no. So Harry and his friends go back to Hogwarts, which is now a terrible place being run by Snape. Okay. So they manage to regain control of it, and Voldemort tells everyone telepathically if they just give him Harry Potter, he won't attack the school. Oh, yikes. Yeah, and one of the Slytherins considers it, so 
McGonagall sends them all to the dungeons. Oh, because that's the Hogwarts house where it's just the evil kids. Exactly. You think that might be kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy if this is how those kids are treated? No, 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 no. It's just a triumphant moment where a teacher locks a bunch of 11-year-olds in a dungeon. Oh, okay. So now Harry's got to go talk to this ghost lady because she knows where a horcrux is. Mm. Spooky. Spooky. Go on. But she's like, no, I don't want to tell you because I told Voldemort back in the day and he was a real jerk about it. Wow, so what does Harry do? He's like, please. And she's like, okay. Wow. Anyway, now Voldemort's going to attack Hogwarts with a bunch of Death Eaters. Uh-oh. So do the good guys take some Felix Felicis liquid luck or something? No, they don't have any of that at the moment. Do they use a time turner to make sure they win? No, those, those are all broken now. Every one of those is broken. Do all the other wizarding schools come and help out as backup? Listen, sir, I'm going to need you to get all the way off my back about potentially helpful magical things we've established in previous movies, okay? Uh, okay, let me get off of the, that thing. Thanks, and so then there's a big old fight and a bunch of people are gonna die. Oh, a bunch of people dying is tight. What? Wow, I don't know why I said that. That was really pretty evil of me. It really was. And I apologize. I don't know where from inside me that came from, but I got some self-reflecting to do for sure. All right. So anyway, then Harry looks inside Voldemort's mind again, which is a thing he can do and realizes that Voldemort's snake is a horcrux. Wow. So I guess Voldemort must send that snake super far away, like to another country to protect it, huh? No, the snake is straight up going around Hogwarts fighting people during the battles. Huh. Yeah. Neville's going to end up killing it, actually. Oh, he is. Yeah. You can see this kid finds an old sword inside the judgy top talking hat and uses that to kill a snake that has a piece of a guy's soul in it. These are kind of weird movies, huh? Kind of, yeah. When you say the things out loud, sounds kind of weird and silly. So what else happens? Well, Voldemort's gonna kill Professor Snape. Oh, how come? Because he realizes that the Elder One is probably tied to Snape, you know, because he's the one who killed Dumbledore, the previous owner. Yikes. So Harry takes some of Snape's tears and puts them inside that, uh, you know, the bowl of backstories there. Oh, and what does he see in there? Well, sir, it turns out that Snape wasn't actually evil this whole time. He just really wanted to hook up with Harry's mom back in the day. Oh, my God. No, but like in a nice redemptive way, you know? Like he was kind of helping Harry this whole time. All right. Yes, he turns out Snape and Lily were really close when they were young kids. Okay. So, you know, in terms of casting, it's really important that we get someone with similar eyes to Daniel Radcliffe, you know? Because we keep saying that thing about how he has his mother's eyes. So that's, you know, that's that's super important. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Hey, you tried this new Angry Birds game yet? These birds are so angry at these pigs. They, they, they don't like them at all. I... Yeah, yeah. Did you hear what I said, though? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, no. I, I definitely heard what you said, for sure. Okay, great. So then Harry finds out that Voldemort is inside him. Oh. Well, like a part of his soul is inside him, so Harry's gotta die or Voldemort won't die. Oh, no. Yeah, so he actually lets Voldemort kill him. Wow. So then he goes to a weird limbo train station with a baby Voldemort, and Dumbledore is like, hey, you can go be alive again if you want. That's fine. You could go do that. Oh, he can. Well, that's... He should do that, probably. Yeah, because now the movie can continue. Wow, magic is very useful for, you know, making movies continue. It sure is, sir. And so then Voldemort and Harry are gonna fight again while being clouds and making scary faces at each other. What? And then the freaking Elder Wand kind of backfires on Voldemort and kills him, because through some technicality, it was actually Harry's wand at that point, kind of. This freaking lucky child. He's just the luckiest child, sir. Wow, well, wow, well, wow. Well. Well, so then 19 years later, they're all grown up, so we're gonna need some pretty convincing makeup work to make them look older. Would you settle for unconvincing? I would. Great. And then we find out that Harry named his son Albus Severus Potter. He named him after the guy who really, really wanted to be with his mom. That's right. That's kinda, that's a little weird, but at least he got that Albus name in there. That's kinda nice. Yeah, the headmaster that wanted to knowingly let Voldemort kill him at the perfect moment. Oh my god, what? And then secretly plotted with the guy that was into his mom for years. All right, I mean... I guess you can name your kids whatever you want. You sure can. And so what do you think? Well, it sounds like a great ending, you know? Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. So how long do you think we have to wait till we start milking this again? Ah, a few years at most. Fantastic. Hi guys, Ryan here. Thanks for watching that pitch meeting. If you hadn't noticed, pitch meeting is now on its very own channel. So if you haven't subscribed yet, that would help out a lot. And of course, you could also hit the like button and the notification button or leave a 2000 word comment about some Harry Potter detail I got wrong. And let me know what pitches you'd like to see next. Okay, bye. I gotta leave.